for here. And what Bill Gaither said about that song. Well, happy uh, Reformation Day. And uh, as I was saying to Obi, maybe in honor of Reformation Day, you should go nail something to someone's, one of your prop's doors or something. Or, you know, maybe some kind of grievance that you have against your a particular prop, just go nail that thing to his door. Or maybe just, better yet, just use some masking tape or something. But, uh, yes, Reformation Day. You know, it was Eric Metaxas who said that that October 31st, he believed, was not the actual day that Luther nailed those 95 theses to the wall. I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember what day he said. He wrote a biography on Luther, Eric Metaxas. I don't, I don't know what he said was the day. I can't remember. But anyway, just a little fact. I don't know if he's right or wrong. But, um, well, I, this morning I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, I did this particular message yesterday in our, in our own church actually Sunday, the day before yesterday, in our own church, uh, being Reformation Day or Sunday, I, I usually take time out to do something from the subject of church history, but uh, last Sunday and, and today I'm going to do what, what I would call a brief 20th century history of Israel. And I think it's kind of neat. So I'm not going to be looking specifically so much expositionally from any texts this morning, and i um, uh, although that is my normal, as you all know, that's my normal approach to things. Today I want to do something a little bit different. And just to kind of kickstart things, I want to just quote for you a, a statement that I recently read. I think it was in one of Michael Block's books. Perhaps it was uh, Dispensational Hermeneutics. He said, he quoted, he quoted Craig Blazing. Blaz, how do you say his name? Blazing? Blazing? Yeah, just like the word blaze. He said, quote, the subject of national and ethnic Israel is not a peripheral but central issue to the storyline of the Bible. In other words, the existence of Israel and its ongoing existence is of great importance. Should Israel ever go out of existence? Should Israel be destroyed? Should the Palestinians, or those who are called the Palestinians today, drive Israel into the ocean, as they said back in 1948 when Israel was about to declare as a nation. They said, the moment you declare yourself as a nation, we are going to drive you into the sea. Should that ever happen, then you cannot trust any of the other promises of God as well. That his promises to you and to me are are tied indirectly or maybe even directly to the promises that he's made to Israel. Uh, the promises he's made to you and to me individually for eternal life and heaven and having our sins forgiven would not be worth, to use an old phrase, a plug nickel um, if God reneges on his promises to Israel. And so as you go through the Bible, you see that God does have a direction, uh, and, and I, I'm so appreciative of the writings of Michael Block here recently. It's been very refreshing. I would suggest another book in getting the big picture of the Bible. There's a book by Rennie Showers called uh, What on Earth is God Doing? That is an excellent book that I refer to a lot. Um, but, uh, but this morning, again, we want to be reminded of God, what God has done for Israel from the 20th century. You know, Romans chapter 11, verse 2 says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. 11, 2 in the chapter of Romans. Or you can go back to Ezekiel, just to bring a little scripture into it here this morning. In Ezekiel chapter 36, and you could look at 37, I'm not going to read all of this, but in Ezekiel 36 verses 22 through 32, God says to Ezekiel, therefore say to the house of Israel, this is Ezekiel 36, 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went, in parentheses here, which they continue to profane and not even acknowledge today. 
Verse 23, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. I would argue that's yet to happen. That hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Verse 24, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful. You will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's never happened for national Israel. Verse 28. And you will live in the land that I give, that I, excuse me, that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you. <laughs> and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field that you may not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Israel is now back in the land. Um, they are gathered there in unbelief, but there's also coming a gathering in belief. They're there today in an unbelief. And all of that goes back to just looking at the last 100 plus years, if you go all the way back to kind of give you a, a sense, and this comes from a lot of other books that I've read, so there's different books I have in my library or had in my library. Sometimes they find their way out somehow. But um, books that talk about, and you can buy these off Amazon or whatever, uh, gives a concise history of Israel. And this is found all over in, some of the, in many of those books. But just let me give you a, a thumbnail sketch here this morning. If you want to write down some of these dates or just kind of remember, or mem remember them, the first date I want you to remember is 1897. That was the, first, the, the year of the first Zionist Congress. And during that, uh, that gathering of, of Jewish people in Basel, Switzerland, they looked for the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And their desire was to do this with the approval of all the major world powers and not through any kind of revolution. The next key date to remember is the year 1917. That was at the end of World War I, when Great Britain came out with what, what, what was called the Balfour Declaration. And the Balfour Declaration became the foundation for the decision of making or establishing a Jewish state. And so in 1917, right after World War I, Great Britain said, quote, this was the official statement, His Majesty's government looks with favor for the establishment of a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. Again, this is post-World War I. And at that time, Palestine was under British control, uh, basically as a result of World War I. And they did not capture it. Bear in mind that the Brits did not capture it from the Palestinians. There, there never was a Palestinian state. You hear that idea forwarded as if Israel stole it or somebody stole it from the Palis a group called the Palestinians. And I, I want to remind you that prior to uh, 1948, anyone who lived in that part of the world of Israel was called a Palestinian, whether they were Jew or Arab. 
And so today, the word Palestinian really became propagandized uh, in 19, around 1967. Uh, right after the Six Day War of 67, which I'll get to in a second. But if you go back in Israel's history, you, you find Israel lost the land, basically, or out of it as of AD 70. And the, Ro and, and the Ro Romans had it for a while. And after the Romans had it for a while, um, the Muslims took a, a group of Muslims took it over from from the Romans later on. And then the Crusaders took it away from the Muslims. And then a group called the Mamluks, M-A-M-L-U-K-S, the Mamluks, which I, I'm having difficulty, dis they, are, they are a bunch of tribes from the Mideast and parts of Asia that kind of collectively came together as I understand it. Uh, I'm a little bit vague on that still. And then after the Mamluks uh, had it for a while, the, the Turks via the Ottoman Empire had that area. And then after the Turks and World War I, then the Brits had control of it. There never was a Palestinian state. It was, Israel was always under one of those different powers going all the way back to AD 70. And so after World War I, Britain had control of that whole area. And uh, it was also Britain that established the the country of Jordan. Jordan is not an ancient country. Jordan is a modern nation. In fact, 80% of the land that Britain captured in 19, after the end of World War I in, in 1917 was given to Jordan. That land, all that land was to be given to Israel according to the, the original intent of the Balfour Declaration. But later on, in the 1940s, Jordan was given that land in May of 1946. Jordan became a country. Two years later, Israel became a country. So Jordan is very, it's just two years older than the nation of Israel, the modern nation of Israel today. Um, and, then, and all that was because, as we'll see in a second, Britain became, began to turn her back more and more on the Jews because she was favoring the Arabs for certain political realities and certain issues related to oil and needing the help of the Arabs. And so uh, the Arabs did not like the Jews, and so the Brits slowly began to focus more on what the Arabs wanted. In 1922, the League of Nations, which was the forerunner of the UN, gave a mandate, gave to the to the United Kingdom or, or Great Britain a mandate to establish a Jewish homeland. That's in 1922. But again, Britain did not follow through on that for, for certain political realities, okay? Because they, 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 they had this mandate, they had the Balfour Declaration, there was the first Zionist Congress back in 1897, and Britain was going to do this. They, they said they were going to do this, but the, the, they slowly backed away from that. And so that takes us into the mid-1930s when Adolf Hitler is beginning his ascendancy to power and Germany begins to persecute the Jews and it was a bit slow at first but it became increasingly and, and more and more severe and then with the establishment of death camps and those concentration camps, um, well, of course, the Jews were trying to flee. Germany, trying to flee Europe. They tried to get into Australia. They tried to get in to the UK, to Canada, and to the United States. Jews were literally fleeing for their lives because of the oppression of Adolf Hitler. And uh, they tried to get to the nation of Israel, to the, the land of Israel at that point. But they could not. Because in 1938, which is just a year before the actual war started in 1939, in 1938, Britain issued what they call a white paper. A white paper is simply a legal document. Uh, we lived in Britain for 10 years, and I always remember hearing on the news, they talked about you know a new white paper was being issued. It's just simply a legal document. They just call it a white paper. But basically, in 1938, this particular white paper restricted Jewish immigration to Israel to 1,500 people per month. So here are all these Jews in the 
a few years later, during when World War II broke out, they're trying to flee to the land of Israel or to any nation, and all the nations were saying, no, 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 we can't let you in, we can't let you in. They're, okay, we'll try to go to the land of Israel. No, you can only, we can only, the Brits said, we can only allow 1,500 people per month into the land of Israel. Now again, why did Britain do that? Was it because Britain was heartless? No, because Great Britain knew that if once World War II broke out as it became, as it looked more and more a possibility and then it actually happened, they wanted Arab help. And in order to secure Arab help, they had to appease the Arabs by not allowing many Jews, if at all any, into the land of Israel. So it was because of Arab pressure. But there was a man by the name of Menachem Begin, and he had established an underground army called the Ergon, E-R-G-O-N. And that underground army began to fight the British. Menachem Begin was uh, fighting the British. Why was he fighting the British? Because there were Jews who were literally fleeing for their lives to get away from Hitler, and they were trying any way they could get to get into the land of Israel. But so Begin, Menachem Begin, only fought the British army in the sense that he was trying to get Jewish people into the land of Israel. And so what that, you know, so there was this animosity that began to develop between the Jews and even the British nation, the, uh, the UK. So then World War II actually did break out. Six million Jews were murdered. Those Jews who survived the Holocaust lost much of their, their possessions, all their possessions, much of their family, uh, in some, many cases their entire family. Where are they going to go? What's going to happen? At the end of World War II, uh, all these Jews now who were still who were still living had lost everything, and so what they tried to do, they many Jewish men they tried to secure these old dilapidated ships in order to take hundreds of people in these dilapidated ships. They tried to take them into the land of Israel on the from from southern Europe over into to Israel. And one of those ships, again, the Brits still had their, their level of only 1,500 Jews per month could go into the land of Israel. There was one particular ship, you've heard of this ship, it's called the Exodus. And it was, like the others, loaded with Jewish passengers wanting to get into the land of Israel. And so the Exodus made its way, um, I think it was from Crete or Cyprus, to, the, to within a few miles of the shores of Israel. And the British Army, and the Na British Navy rather, had their ships along the border there, or along the coast there. And the British Navy said, go back! <laughs> and uh, the commanding officer of the Exodus says, we are not going back. And the Brits said, well, we will board your ship, to which the commander of the Exodus said, we will blow up this ship and all who were on it. Now, you have to understand that the events of the Holocaust are coming out at this time as well. And so that's putting pressure. Everyone is hearing now of the Jews who were slaughtered in Hitler's death camps. And so here are these, these, these Jews on, this, on the ship called the Exodus, and the commanding officer said, look, I will blow this ship up. And it will be on across the news all around the world. The Brits did not want any part of that, you see. And so the Brits said, well, we will just stay here until you leave. And the exodus, the commander of the exodus says, we are not going to leave and we are not going to eat. And when someone dies of starvation, we'll throw their dead bodies over the side of the ship for the whole world to see. And all these floating bodies will be in the water around our ship, and the world will see what you're doing to us. Well, again, Great Britain became increasingly frustrated with, with the Jews, and they 
gave the whole issue of control of the land. They basically wanted to get away from the, the Mideast altogether. So they began to pull out their 100,000 troops that were stationed there. And as they pulled out their 100,000 troops, they always seemed to pull out in favor of the Arabs. They would vacate those areas, but they would do whatever they could to stifle uh, the Israelites or the Jews uh, as they pulled out. Now again, you remember back in the Old Testament, God said to Abraham, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And so while Britain had a mandate from the Balfour Declaration to, to establish a homeland for the Jew, but because of political expediency, Britain pulled away from that mandate. I, when we lived in Britain, uh, I had an 85-year-old next-door neighbor by the name of Val. And uh, we had like a little three-foot-high fence uh, separating our, our homes, and we would often be out there on a nice day just chatting and enjoying one another's company, talking about all kinds of things. And uh, he said to me, we, were, we got on the subject of the Mideast, and he made the statement that all the problems in the Mideast were because of the Jews to which I, I stiff-armed back on that, on that comment. And uh, he didn't like it because he thought that was kind of an obvious thing to say. But, uh, but that's sort of the mentality of, of most of the people in Britain even today. So when we come to the end of World War II, uh, we have this case of the Exodus, the ship called the Exodus. And the uh, U.N. now is getting control of the land of the, of the Mideast uh, because Britain was pulling away. They wanted nothing of it. And so 80% of the land, I said, was given to the country of Jordan. And that nation was started in 1946. And uh, there's only 20% of the land left of the original deeded land that was to be given to, to Israel. Of the 20% that was left, Israel only got a portion of the 20% that was left. So that's, that's what's happened. And um, Israel, with great reluctance, knowing that it was far less land than what they really were promised, accepted the deal. But even at that point in time, the Arabs said, we are not satisfied. And so the Jews entered the land. More and more Jews were allowed to go into the land. At that point, there were a little over 600,000 Jews in the land of, of Israel at the, say, 1948, the year of their nationhood. And um, there was a guy by the name of Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister of, of Israel. He stood up on one occasion, and um, he declared Israel to be a nation among the other nations of the world, and the surrounding Arab nations had already told Ben Gorion and the other leaders of, it, of the Israel of the Jews said, "If you declare yourself a nation, we're going to drive you into the sea." And Israel said, "No, we're going to we, we declare ourselves a nation." And they even told the Arabs who lived alongside of them, "Look, you can keep your land. We will give you representation in our Knesset." And they have done that for all these years. There are, there are Arabs sitting in, even to this very day, in, in the Knesset of Israel. Israel has welcomed them. But the Arabs, the other Arab nations, said, um, look, all of you Arabs who are in the land that's been given to Israel, just pull out and gather yourselves on the west bank of the Jordan River. And in one week or two weeks, we will drive Israel, the, the Jews, into the sea. And then you can come back and get not only your land back, but you can get your Jewish neighbor's land. And you will have more than what you had when you left. And so that's what they did. They pushed all the Arabs, or as many as they could, to the West Bank. But the Jews begged them not to do that, but many of them did. Now, I remember the, 
The land that's been given to Israel, even to this day, at its most narrow point, is only nine miles wide. Now, this is 1948. And let me back up a little bit, because I left out an, an important guy by the name of Harry Truman. Just before Israel declared herself a nation, Truman was told by, his, by the secretary, of, by the, the, the State Department, and by many of his own generals that do not recognize Israel if she declares herself to be a nation. Do not do it, because it will be so embarrassing that if you, if you side along with Israel, then in a week or two or a month, they're destroyed. It's going to be very embarrassing for you, Mr. President. So you cannot side with Israel. Well, Truman was leaning that direction during this time until one of his co-workers from Independence, Missouri, who worked in the, in the shoe biz with Harry when he was in Independence, Missouri, uh, an old buddy, and I don't remember his name now, flew to Washington, D.C. and requested an audience with President Truman, his old friend. And he went into his office and basically begged him to acknowledge Israel. And Truman said, okay. And he did it. And, uh, and uh, God has honored our country, I believe, because of that. He got, if you ever noticed, Britain began to really decline severely after World War II as a nation. And I believe America ascended for a while because of our support for Israel and because of the fact that we send out more missionaries around the world than, than any other nation in the world. And so Truman went against the, most of the advisors in his administration and uh, acknowledged Israel. There was another gal, another person, a gal, who was key at this time. Her name is Golda Meir. And Golda Meir, right about the time Israel declared herself to be a nation, they knew that they were going to be going to war. So Golda Meir, who, by the way, was born in Russia, raised in the United States, uh, educated with a college here, was a school teacher here. I mean, she lived up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for a long time. And, but it was Golda Meir who wanted to get back to her homeland, so she left the U.S., moved back to Israel because she was now part of the Zionist movement of establishing this homeland for, for Israel, that Golda Meir was then sent back from Israel, back to the United States to raise money. And she hoped to raise maybe 10 or $12 million in total. Uh, on their first meeting that, they were, that she had uh, trying to raise money, she raised... Uh, $20 million, the first meeting she had in raising support, because they needed to buy equipment they, to defend themselves. They had nothing, no military equipment. The Arabs were going to come against them in four months. And so, and by the time she was done, she had raised $60 million in 1948. I mean, that's 60 million, that's a lot more money than $60 million today. And so, Golda Meir then, the, the word was passed out that for Israeli agents to go and buy whatever they could find in terms of weapons and implements to defend themselves, and they began to do that. And again, it's just amazing how God has blessed America because of our embracing of Israel. Now, again, Truman's recognition of Israel was critical to Israel, absolutely critical. And so then we come to September 1948, four months after nationhood. There were six Arab nations um, all gathering, including Egypt and Syria, and Jordan was actually brought into it, and um, some others. And they were all gathering against Israel. And... Um, on one, there's, a several, there's actually several stories that I've been able to glean in some of my reading. I, some of them are going to sound so fantastically uh, great that it, it almost defies the imagination of how God has sovereignly protected Israel even though they are gathered in unbelief. 
for instance, at this particular time, September 1948, there in the south, there was um, actually out, out at sea, uh, there were some Egyptian ships right off the shore of Tel Aviv, as the story goes, and they were bombing Tel Aviv, they were bombing other places around, along the coast, and Israel had no air force. And so there was the story of two men jumped in a little Piper Cub airplane, and they got in, and they began to make low passes over the, Ar the Egyptian armada of ships off the coast of Israel, about where Tel Aviv is. And they began to drop homemade bombs from the little Piper Cub airplane down on the ships below. And finally, in, and, uh, finally in uh, desperation, they flew very low and crashed into the largest ship of the Egyptian armada, and both of those men died. But the fantastic thing is, the Egyptian ships, the rest of them left. Wow. Just one little Piper Cub airplane? Yeah, that's how the story goes. Or there's another episode where Egypt sent a strong military force north, that is from Israel south, through the Sinai, and it was going to be a two-pronged attack. One prong was to attack Jerusalem, the other was to go along the coast up to Tel Aviv and to link up later with Iraqi and Syrian troops. And in going through the Sinai, this one prong of the Egyptian army had to pass through a little kibbutz, and the farmers knew that the force was coming, so they sent their wives and children to safety, and, they, and there were 70 Israeli soldiers, and they had about uh, some others who joined them, so altogether there was 150 of them. And when the Egyptians arrived, there were, there were over 2,000 of them with tanks. And this little group in the kibbutz, these Jews had, as the story goes, they had, there were two doctors, four nurses, four automatic weapons, and a rocket launcher. All right, that's, that's how the story goes. I, you know, I say, do I believe this? Is it just, is just sort of an exaggeration? I don't know. But Israel has survived. I do know that. And so this Egyptian force, with all their army, their half-tracks and their tanks and some air cover with Messerschmitt airplanes from Germany, this 150-man force held back those, that 2,000-man-plus Egyptian army. There was another guy who came to the rescue who had four Jeeps by the name of Moshe Diane. Remember that guy with the patch on his eye? I thought he was kind of cool. And they had these four Jeeps with the machine guns mounted on the back. You know how that, there used to be a TV show a long time ago called the, the Rat Patrol. I used to watch, I used to love that show. You know, the guys who come up with the sand dunes, they're fighting Rommel and, the, and they've got their machine guns just going ablaze. Well, Moshe Diane then also helped in the moving of the Egyptian army out. There are other stories that I have here in my notes, but all this is that I could account that were equally fantastic and equally providential or perhaps even miraculous. Sometimes I'm not sure where providence and the, the miraculous ends. They, they, I mean, they kind of, do they overlap sometimes? Uh, but in, the, in this case, it seems like there is some overlap at times. We could talk about the sovereign work of God in behalf of unbelieving Jewish people. In 1956, Israel tried to move against Israel again. Uh, president Nasser, who was the president of Egypt, and again, Moshe Dayan with jeeps and tanks, with much more equipment in 1956, he stood in Nasser's way, and Israel was saved. But there comes, then the next major time was in 1967, and I'll kind of bring it to a close here with some of this. In 1967, there was a six-day war. But Israel knew she was about to be attacked. Israel has one of the greatest uh, intel agencies in the world called the Mossad. And uh, generally, they were, they've been pretty good, although recently, I think they dropped the ball. Uh, but back in 1967, the Mossad and the Jews knew they were about to be attacked. They knew beyond doubt. And they always, they developed the, the, the idea that we need to attack. When we know we're going to be attacked, we have to attack first. We have to attack preemptively. 
And so the Jews would do that. Uh, they knew they knew where and when and how it was coming. And so just Israel decided to hit first. And so she sent her planes out to sea where there were some Egyptian ships. And um, they dealt with them real quick. And at the same time, they came back over land. As, as I'm reading the story here, they came in dangerously low to get below the Egyptian radar. And they strafed and bombed a lot of the, the armies that were gathered there about to attack. And uh, all this happened within a very short period, in a few hours. The entire war in 1967 was only six days. And um, interesting little sidetrack to that, that President Nasser, who was the president of Egypt, he, he phoned King Hussein, who was the king of Jordan. Jordan was trying to stay out of it in 1967. But King Hussein, because Nasser and his people and the Syrians were getting clobbered in this six-day war, Nasser wrote King or called King uh, Hussein of Jordan, said, look, uh, we are defeating the Israeli army and we are going to drive them into the sea. If you are not with us, you are against us. Now, all that is a lie because he wasn't about, he wasn't doing that. But Nasser simply wanted help and he wanted Jordanian help. And so he tricked King Hussein to coming into the war, which he did, and the Jordanians were clobbered as well. The Jordanians were clobbered in this, the, the Egyptians, the Syrians, all in that six-day war. And during that, in that time, Israel recaptured the city of Jerusalem, which at that time was under Jordanian control. They recaptured the West Bank from Jordan, and in the south, they got much of the Sinai back from Egypt, and in the north from Syria, they, they gained back a place called the Golan Heights. Now, the interesting thing about the Golan Heights is on the northeast side of Israel, up north, or just on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. By the way, my wife and I are planning to go with Dr. Ricketts on his Israel tour, if it still materializes next May. Uh, just a little side thought. We're getting kind of excited about that idea and maybe see some of these sites. But the Golan Heights were recaptured. Now, what, what was the deal about the Golan Heights? Well, they're high. And for 19 years, the Syrians would shower bombs down on the kibbutzes below. So they had the height advantage from the Golan Heights. And the, the Israelis had learned to dig tunnels and have basically a lot of their homes were underground. And they would spend much of their time underground because they lived under the threat of these bombings from the, from the Golan Heights by the Syrians. It was at this time, and I want to introduce you to a name that you, you shouldn't forget in, in Israel, Israeli history. This, the name is Eli Cohen. And I've read stories about, I love spy stories. That's a, that's a weakness. I love military intrigue. I love spy stories. And, the, and there's even a movie on Netflix about Ellie Cohen. I can't remember the title of it. Maybe you can, called what? The Spy. And uh, I just love that stuff. Ellie Cohen was a Jew who was raised in Egypt. He knew Egyptian, he was, he was Egyptian culturally, but he was a Jew in his heart. In his, he was Jewish in his, in his um, genetics. And so after being raised in Egypt, he was trained in by the Mossad to be an agent. And once he was fully trained, the Mossad sent him to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and they had all, he was, his, all his papers were falsified, and he became a, a salesman uh, for fine furniture. And he began to hobnob with all the Syrian officials who were actually living in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he became very, very rich. He met all the Syrians there. He had a magnificent home there in Buenos Aires. And he would uh, throw parties there. And then eventually, he actually moved back to Syria. And many of the Syrians who, who he met in Buenos Aires were also back in Syria. And so he became a part of the Syrian uh, 
hobnob culture, the, the elite culture. And um, he got even really close with the president of Syria. And the president of Syria, his, his daughter fell madly in love with Eli Cohen, and actually they married and started having children. The, the sad part is he also had a wife and children back in Israel at the same time. But that's, that's the life of a spy, you see. And so he also had a very powerful radio transmitter. Well, one particular day, let me get to the point here. The generals of the Syrian generals took Eli Cohen to the Golan Heights. And uh, they were telling him about the layout. They were showing him all the equipment up there and where the mine, there's minefields that were laid there. And he was sketching all this stuff on, in front of them, making sketches of, of, of what they were saying. And um, then Eli made a comment to the generals. He says, you know, the Israelis are not dummies. I'm mean, getting this from the, from, the, from the book I read about him. The Israelis are not dummies. Before they attack, they will send over observation planes, and they will see where your tanks and pillboxes and troops are. You'll want to conceal these things. Besides, it's so hot up here, your men need shade to cool themselves. So plant this particular kind of tree uh, around all these different pillboxes and where you have this equipment to provide shade and concealment to your men. Eucalyptus trees, that's right, that's right. Well, Eli Cohen then, with his powerful transmitter, uh, and, the, and the general said, that's a great idea. We'll do that. And so they did that. And so Eli Cohen transmitted back to the Israeli authorities, uh, look, every time you see a eucalyptus tree on the Golan Heights, bomb it. <laughs> and so when the Six-Day War broke out, the Israelis knew exactly where every one of those trees and they, their jets hit every one of those spots and just blew them all to smithereens. And so Eli Cohen was the hero of the Six-Day War. Well, shortly after that whole thing, just to bring my story to a close here, uh, Eli Cohen was sending some other messages back to, to Israel. And this was, I think it was at night, and it was the Indian embassy in Damascus was having problems hearing some override on the signals they were trying to send back to their people back in India. And it was such a powerful override that they began to complain to the Syrian authorities who then looked into it and they found out by following the signal with their equipment that it was Eli Cohen who was transmitting those signals. And obviously, they were very upset and embarrassed. They immediately arrested him, gave him a quick trial, and he was executed, hung upside down in the Damascus Square for days for all to see. Well, after, shortly after he was arrested, before he was executed, the Israelis said, look, we'll give you 600 of your Syrian soldiers who we have in confinement here in Israel. We'll give them back to you for giving us Eli Cohen. 600 guys for one. Yeah, I don't think the Cardinals will ever get that kind of deal. Well, the Syrians said, no way, no way. Then Eli was executed, and then the Israelis actually offered $12 million in farm equipment to the Syrians just to get the body back for a dead body, to which the Syrians again said, no way. They had him buried in an unmarked grave. Well... There's other things that happened in 1973 when Israel knew again and they were about ready to be attacked. And um, just a quick synopsis of that. They actually knew they were being attacked, but somehow the Egyptians and the Syrians did gain the advantage, but they stopped. They were, they were closing in on Israel. They actually had, were winning the battle and they were closing in as the, as the story goes, but they somehow just stopped advancing because... They thought, this is too good to be true. We're winning the battle. This must be a trap. We're being set up for a trap, and they left. They were utterly spooked, as the story goes, in 1973. Uh, that's what I've read. If you want to do your own study on that. But it's, again, another amazing account of how somehow God has protected his people even in their unbelief, I believe. And I say all this to come to a close, because I've gone way over time, but I just had to get through all this, that God's promises to Israel 
are true. And if he ever reneges on Israel, then we cannot count on him to keep his promises to you and to me. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your promises that you hold very true. We thank you, and we believe them, we trust them. We see your hand over your own people, even though today they still remain in unbelief. And we know that you will take care of them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.